This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. Charlotte Mayor Vi Lyles has been on this program just about every month since taking office, and she was scheduled to be with us with us this hour. Trouble is, she was overscheduled, and she can't be here today. Fortunately, we were able to call in a pinch hitter. Mayor Pro Tem Julie Eiselt, welcome back. Thank you, program. Mike. Good to see you again. Uh, people can join our conversation. If listeners can join our conversation by emailing us at charlottetalks at wfae.org. You can search for us. Jeez. You can search for us on Facebook, get to us through Twitter at Charlotte Talks, and you can watch Julie on Facebook Live this morning. Now, we knew, let's start with the CIAA. We knew the tournament was probably not going to come back after their contract expires in 2020. They were shopping it around. They made no secret of that. Uh, cities, including our own, bid on uh, mm -hmm. the, the tournament, but they chose Baltimore, Maryland. It was announced this week. They won it. City Council found out about this just before you were to convene your meeting on Monday night. Did that su decision surprise you? Why were you surprised? They didn't give you a heads up, nothing? Well, it didn't, su it didn't take everyone by surprise. I mean, <laughs> this is a tournament that has been here that we've had time. for 15 years, and there's no other college tournament that doesn't rotate cities. It had rotated. It had been in Raleigh. Raleigh lost it. We were excited to get it. So if if I were the board or if I were a fan for the CIAA, I'd say, hey, what about my city? You yeah. know, there's 13 schools in the league. You've had it 15 years. So it's not a total surprise, nor no. should it be. But this leaked, evidently, before they, they were going to make their announcement the next day. And somehow it leaked out just before your meeting. Would they normally have given you a, a phone call to say, sorry, but we're going to Probably. Baltimore? Yeah. I, Just didn't have an opportunity to They do might it. have. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't call me. <laughs> <laughs> so the impact of this is big. In fact, the observer calls it massive. Would you agree with that characterization? Um, it's big in, from an economic right. impact standpoint right. on the hotels, on the restaurants. It's $50.5 million. million. Yeah, it is big. But I'd like to think that we are a city that will attract other conventions. If we're putting all of our eggs in one basket with a convention or with a, a tournament like this, then that's not a good thing if we are looking at ourselves as a convention city. We're not in Miami, New Orleans. We're not a vacation destination city. So we have to really... Um, look at this and say, what else do we have coming? There are other events coming that are exciting, so I would hope that our, our prosperity doesn't rise and fall on one tournament. But this is the biggest event. It has been the biggest event every year for 15 years in terms of mm -hmm. economic impact at $50.5 million. And it's also an yeah. example of how incentives uh, work, because although that $50 million doesn't go to the city, it goes to restaurants and hotels and mm -hmm. Lyft and Uber and taxi companies, etc. Uh, the city did give up some money to attract it in the first place yes. and keep it here. What did it cost us to act as the host city? It costs about $2 million, and that comes out of the revenue from the hotel, motel tax. Um, so, yes, any city has to put up something that's scholarship money. It's um, facility money that we put up front. So it does cost us something, and, and it is a huge loss. But I'd like to think that we'll be in a position to bid for it three years from now. We put $16.8 million into scholarships over the course of the time that the tournament has been here. But you're saying that this really doesn't cost taxpayers money because it comes from the hotel motel tax, Correct. not from the property tax or anything like that. That's right. right. So e these are incentives that we don't feel but that pump money into yeah. the economy. Right. Uh, when they moved the tournament to Charlotte uh, years ago, uh, the, Centr the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, which is their official mm -hmm. name, also moved their headquarters here. And the headquarters, at least for the, for the time yeah. being, <laughs> will remain in Charlotte. But they're going to move the games to Baltimore from 2021 through 2023. Attendance, and we've talked about this on this program with the CIAA, attendance here has been on the decline. They actually uh, had to rope off seats in the arena downtown the last time because they didn't want to show empty seats. Uh, but uh, is it, you think that it's because after 15 years, people, and I guess college fans linger long after graduation, but still the bulk of them are in that four-year window, that after four years, five years, six years, seven years of coming to the same place at the same time of right. year, you just get tired of it. I, you know, and I think that's really what it's about. There's been a lot of talk about other things, but at the end of the day, the fan base, that was the number two reason when they do, when CIAA gives, does their survey, the number two 
uh, request from the fans was move it around a little bit. Let's yeah. let's have it in other cities. Because you know Charlotte, downtown Charlotte, has changed a lot mm-hmm. in 15 years, but not year to year. No, <laughs> not, every not so single much. year, right? <laughs> Coming to the same city. So uh, on on WFAE, CIAA board chair James Anderson said that price gouging at Charlotte hotels had become an issue. We talked about this a year or so ago, and he talked about ago. it recently yeah. with one of our reporters. Uh, we we did have that instance of the CIAA surcharge on okay. bar bills at the Ritz. Were other hotels and motels and, and restaurants involved in that? Did they charge a premium because the tournament was in town? To my recollection, the Ritz was the only one that... Okay. Um, so when he says price gouging this. at hotels, he's really talking about the Ritz? Well, that's the only incident I remember being reported. Okay. I don't recall that any other hotels um, were discovered to have been doing that. Does, uh, does the Ritz or any other hotels charge change their prices during other types of events and conventions that come to town? I mean, if we held a Super Bowl here, which we hope to do someday, mm-hmm. uh, will there be a Super Bowl surcharge on things? Well, and that's their food and beverage. So the hotels actually lower their – they negotiate a rate for the CIAA. So – uh, our bid, I believe, was that the hotels were 5% below what they usually charge. So so they make it up at the bar. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> you're going to have to ask them. <laughs> it certainly isn't a contractual practice. So in, in announcing their decision, uh, CIAA Commissioner Jackie McWilliams, who's also been on this program, said, this is an exciting time for the CIAA. This is a quote. As we have an opportunity to bring the basketball tournament to a new market, moving it closer to many of our northern institutions who have traveled to Charlotte for more than a decade. So now they'll be closer. These northern schools will be closer. I I don't know where those northern schools are, but they'll be closer to Baltimore uh, because that's where it's going to be. But nine of these conferences, uh, of these schools in this 13-member conference are in North Carolina. So do you think this is really just a temporary move to throw a bone to some folks in the northern stretches of their conference and let them have Baltimore for a couple of years and then come home? You know, I think it, it's really about increasing their fan base. And a lot of the uh, folks that come down to Charlotte that have come down here aren't even going to the game. So they've got to get people into the game. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, part of that for them, their decision is it, 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 when you look at the NFL going to Mexico or Toronto, they're just trying to increase their fan base. It's not because the fans in the United States aren't interested, although – it's been on the decline, but this is a and business That's why decision. the NFL takes the games to London once Correct. or twice a year. Yeah, to increase the fan base. And, and so they're, they've got to do that because the fan base has not been on the rise. And so they've got to f- make a business decision, which is what they did. I think that we need to look at it to say, we're really lucky we've had it for 15 years. It's highly unusual. And we should be starting to talk about our bid three years from now. Okay. Uh, Baltimore uh, offered them uh, rent-free use of their Royal Farms Arena. Did they pay for the arena here? Do you know? You may not know. Um, I think the city put some money towards, you know, because they have to close it, which I don't think any of those cities had a facility the size of Spectrum Arena. So I don't know how big Baltimore's facility is, but it wasn't the size of Spectrum. So so they're coming in at, that's a $700,000 value, according to Baltimore, and they'll also contribute $1.5 million in scholarships for member institutions in the CIAA. Our bid was described as aggressive. Though Councilmember James Mitchell called this, called it, and I quote here, I'm going to stress that I'm quoting James Mitchell, a piss-poor bid. Uh, <laughs> do you know what that bid included? How, what, what did our bid have in it? Uh, to my knowledge, our bid had the, one, had the, the scholarship offer. They wanted it increased, and we kept it the same. I, I can't speak to his comments. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe that the council as a whole felt that way. Um, we thought we felt that it was a good bid, but we always knew that there was talk that that the CIAA wanted to try it in other markets because their fan base was saying that. Uh, the CIAA board chair said that Baltimore shared a vision of how the CIAA basketball tournament could be woven into the fabric of the city. We've had some tensions surrounding the CIAA tournament, Uh, not just the price gouging, but there have been incidents of violence that were not directly connected in any way to the tournament, except there were people who were in town who took it upon themselves to cause some trouble, and they did. Mm -hmm. Uh, With or without those incidents, is Charlotte the kind of city that can weave into its fabric a basketball tournament? 
not just their tournament, any tournament, uh, the, uh, aside from Speed Week and perhaps the Super Bowl, are we the kind of city that weaves you into our fabric for the time that you're visiting? It? Absolutely. Really? We had it woven in for 15 years. That's why they stayed. So, you know, again, I don't, I don't read that much into it. Okay. I think that we have shown that we're a great place to have a conference, um, a, a tournament. We're a great place to have a convention. Uh, that is our brand. And so, you know, with sports, we look at the sports tournaments, the uh, college football. Um, we've gotten some NCAA tournaments, uh, you know, not the, not the, the big dance, but uh, right. others leading up to it. And I think that we're a great city for that because you can stay downtown, you can, or in, in uptown, you can stay right there. The facilities are right there. Uh, people are excited about it. So, How does this compare with, to what, what, you, what we think the Republican convention will bring in, this $50.5 million? Oh, probably less than half. Really? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's over $100 million what the, these national con political conventions bring in. So, um, you know, we've got the All-Star so that'll Game. So that'll make up for it in two years. As, <laughs> right. As will the All-Star Game. I think there's a couple other conventions that are getting ready to be announced. So, you know, we need to look at this as being a diversified sure. convention city. But how will we replace that money? And, and, like, year to year, $50.5 million is nothing to sneeze at, particularly mm -hmm. if you operate a hotel or a restaurant. I mean, that's a lot of money coming right. in. In that week. Well, we've got the convention center. So, so that's, we still have it for two more years. So they've got a couple years to plan for that. Um, we've got the convention center expansion that's coming. That's going to make a big difference because a lot of um, conferences have not been able, and conventions have not been able to uh, work with our outdated model in our convention center. And so when that remodeling is done, that's going to be, and that's right around, I believe, the time of the convention, the Republican convention. We've got more hotels coming online. I think things are just getting better and more attractive. So when you say they will have to figure this out, you're talking about CRVA, the Charlotte Regional Visitors, whatever it's called? CRVA? Yeah. For to figure out what, how to replace that revenue, right? It's their job to that's do that. That's their job. And will, yes. you, will they have to do it with a bunch of smaller events, or can they can they capture a big fish that will bring in fifty and a half million dollars? I think that's their job. So <laughs> I sure hope they can. How important? I believe they can. How important in the scheme of things is replacing that amount of money? Well, it's dollars. I mean, it. You know, when we lost. Um, conventions and events because of HB2, that hits the pockets of everyday people in the service industry. So that, you know, we have been mindful of that the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, the Republican convention was, was a convention that met, means a lot to the people in the service industry, to party planners, to caterers, to florists, to hourly workers. And so that, that's what's most important, is finding, it, whether it's a big or small convention, City Councilman Justin Harlow, we only have 30 seconds left, okay. says the CRVA uh, will we'll need to study we'll need to study why Charlotte couldn't keep the tournament. Because we also failed to attract Amazon and a couple of other big economic plums last year. Are we doing something wrong, or is this, do you really think this is just, they want a change? I've been saying with the Amazon situation, not that I, it's not about Amazon for me, but I want to know why we lost Amazon. And we still haven't been given a good debriefing on looking at the reasons why we don't have Amazon. I think it helps the CRVA. It helps the city council. It helps uh, the service industry to know that. Okay. We'll come back and talk about Amazon then and, and e-scooters and the Cross uh, Charlotte Trail, among other things. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Tyndall Subaru Gastonia, featuring the new Outback with eyesight safety technology that sees problems and initiates action to help avoid trouble. Details at TyndallSubaru.com and on Facebook at Tyndall Subaru. And St. Mary's School, an all-girls high school in Raleigh with boarding and day options, welcoming prospective families for overnight and visitation day, January 21st and 22nd. Information at sms.edu. The CIAA tournament dumps Charlotte. We've talked a little bit about that. We'll talk about it again tomorrow on the local news roundup. The 9th Congressional District saga continues with Republican Mark Harris running from reporters. He says he was running toward the Clemson-Alabama game. E-scooters are coming closer to being regulated on Charlotte streets, and the city's looking for money to finish the trail. But we're also talking about our roundtable of reporters details those and other stories on this program tomorrow at 9. 
Most of America's asylum seekers and undocumented immigrants come from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. These countries are fighting poverty, corruption, and crime problems that many believe the U.S. helped create. Now the U.S. and Mexico plan to spend billions on a kind of Marshall Plan for Central America. Will it work? And if so, how? Next time on 1A. 1A coming up from 10 to noon right after Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR news source. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. This is the day for our monthly conversation with Charlotte Mayor Vi Lyles, but she was overscheduled, and so we have with us the Mayor Pro Tem of the city, Julie Iselton. I just want to set your mind at ease here. You feel free to answer any question I ask you speaking for the city and for the mayor, because City of Charlotte Code Section 3.24b <laughs> states, in the absence or incapacity of the mayor, all his they need to update this. Yeah. All his duties, powers, and obligations shall be vested in the mayor pro tem. So there you England, go. England, they call that the air and the spare. So. <laughs> so you mentioned, I wasn't going to talk about Amazon, but you mentioned Amazon and, 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 and the fact that we really haven't, you, we being council and city government, not being really given a reason for right. why. We lost Amazon to, uh, to, uh, to New York and the suburbs of Washington and Crystal City in Virginia. Uh, some say we dodged a bullet uh, by not getting it. But uh, <laughs> we'll see how it works out up there. But, but uh, do you know what was in our proposal? Have you yeah. ever seen our You still no, don't know. I still have not seen it. Why don't Why? why? It, I don't know. Because it's not a city proposal. They didn't make the proposal. A, it was the Charlotte Center City. Not no. It was uh, uh, the chamber and uh, the regional, regional partnership. partnership. Yeah. Go so th- since the city wasn't involved, do you have a right to see it? I think so. I, you know, and, and what it bo- boils down to is, I'm not sure having a right to see it is what's important. It's it's kind of like if you do, you do go on a job interview, you don't get the job. It's one thing to say you know, bad talk the employer. It's another thing to say, hey, tell me what I did wrong so I can do better next time. Yeah. And I think that's the approach we have to take is, what, what didn't we do right? You know, Amazon apparently gave lengthy debriefings to some cities and 20-minute debriefings to others. I think we got the shorter version. And I just, I'd like to know why. Well, given the cities they chose, we're in a different league. We Don't are. you think? We're yes. not New York, so never we will speculate. be. We're not, we're not the D.C. suburbs. Right. We can not. speculate, and that's and it's it's kind of obvious that they were looking for that tech talent. But I would I still want to know. I think that well, they stress they stress transportation. Everybody knows yeah. that the city of New York has probably the most amazing subway. So it, although it's in bad repair, it, it go, <laughs> it's it, be shut for a while. It goes everywhere, <laughs> and it's Crystal City, Virginia, is right on the metro line. It's two seconds from the airport. Uh, the metro goes all over the uh, yeah. Washington metropolitan area. It's not just one train going in two different directions. It goes everywhere. Right. So don't you think we can we can we compete with something like that? Uh, that's the will of the people. So when we and I'm looking at this issue now with transportation and planning. So when we look at our bus routes, it's a chicken and the egg, right? Nobody rides the bus. People say because they don't come frequently enough. Well, they can't come, we can't go buy buses and put more routes out there unless people ride the bus. Right. The only city in this country that's really bucked the trend and has higher bus and mass transit ridership is Seattle. Mm-hmm. And they just passed a $52 billion bond a couple of years ago for mass transit, 52 oh, billion. Billion, billion. in, I, in that's a what city. We, said. we were out there with their council. We said, I'm sorry, was that a B? <laughs> <laughs> it's just stunning. And it's Where's that of, money coming from? Of course, Seattle taxpayers. already, well, yeah, but Seattle has the, ha, they have Amazon, they got yeah. Microsoft, they've got, they've got they're, they're, they're the whole tech center of the country out, outside Amazon of California. But chose not to, you know, it's not, I have a, one of my kids lives out there, and they're not at the favorite company of the residents of, of Seattle. Yeah. They buy bus stops from right. the public transit system, so now your bus stop's gone, and it's for a Google or Microsoft right. or Amazon employee. Um, Seattle makes it hard to drive. It's expensive to park anywhere, even on street parking. They make it difficult to get in your car. And Deliberately? Part, yeah, yeah, because they want, they want to push Don't get people. any ideas. Oh, you're what smiling else would at you me. Like to know? 
<laughs> so where no. does the money come from? Where does that? Where is that? What is it? Fifty billion dollars? It's, it's a regional tax. Where is so, it? Uh, but they got ranchers. In what form? It, they got ranch uh, property tax. Okay. People on the other side of the mountain that probably don't ever get on light rail agree. So, like Denver, it took them ten years. It probably took Seattle that long to get people to agree to it as to why that's good. So when I said don't get any ideas, you were very quiet with a big smile on your face. You've already got any ideas. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but we, ha- we have to look at the whole ecosystem. Um, cars are, you know, it's cheap to drive these days, so we have to be realistic about that. People aren't going to get out of their cars unless it's really painful to do so. Yes, but to get out of your car, it's kind of, you're, we're going back to the chicken and egg thing. Yeah. If you want people to get out of their cars, you have to give them alternatives. Exactly, right. And so it is a chicken and the egg. You have to invest in it first. Uh, but but we do have some corridors that I think we could start with where it's painful. I don't care what kind of car you have mm-hmm. or how many cars you have. It's painful coming up Providence Road in the morning or going out Providence Road, Central Avenue. 77. Right. And so, well, let's leave that alone because that's the states, but with okay. roads All that, right. although so is Providence. But looking at those roads and saying, let's take one of the lanes just during rush hour and close it off for bus rapid transit for a dedicated bus lane to go in and out of the city you know let's let's do that let's run a pilot and see how that works i, I think there's ideas that you guys want to be reelected <laughs> well wouldn't you know i mean people in ballantyne are frustrated that it takes them so long to get into uptown for work okay i mean i'm not saying we shouldn't do it without public input I'd love the public suggestions on what we had a guy come to council two years ago, an older gentleman with a little piece of paper that he held up and he had drawn um, a, an idea like that on the piece of paper and everybody went, well, that's interesting, but let's follow up on it, see what the public thinks about it and if there's the demand. Okay. Well, speaking of transportation alternatives, let's talk about e-scooters because last year you know, the city... haven't yet. Well, haven't what? <laughs> have talked about nobody's it. talked about e-scooters yet. Of course not, no. <laughs> uh, but last year the city decided to allow some more scooters on the street. I think they put them on the street and then you allowed them to put them on the street because I, I think they beat you to the punch, if I recall correctly. Yeah, but, and you decided to wait on regulating scooters until the legislature came up with their own regulations because this is happening this phenomenon is happening in several cities around North Carolina and why put regulations in only to have them changed or overturned by the state but now council is debating and you will debate I believe on Monday Mm -hmm. whether to go ahead and beat the legislature to the punch why the change of heart well the legislature kind of indicated that they're not um, they've decided not to regulate vehicles they regulate motor vehicles, and vehicles are defined as the scooters, the e-bikes, um, not the four-wheel motor vehicles like an automobile. So it, other cities have already done it. We feel that it's imperative that we put some rules in place. There's certainly – we can talk to the legislature about it. One of the things that I have a concern about is yeah, – But before – last year, before Christmas, you decided staff, that – Staff. Staff said decided. That. So the council is overruling the staff. Council – has encouraged the staff to move forward with putting some rules in place. Why? Because we feel that it's imperative to the safety of, of pedestrians. Because Braxton well. Winston was, uh, expressed a little concern last year about over-regulating these things. Right. You'll, you'll kill the, the whole idea if you, right. if you put too much regulation on it. That, that's, has he changed his mind? I, you'd have to ask him about that. Okay. But the point is that any city, cities have either banned scooters or allowed scooters with rules. And the scooters, that, the rules that we're proposing, there are other cities. Denver has almost the exact same game plan. Okay. Um, so we're talking to other cities that have said, that, that agree, scooters are good. They are especially, um, we, we have found that people, the highest income users are people earning 25000 and below. So we know that it's an equitable option for transportation, but it shouldn't, it's an option. It's a tool. It's another choice. Pedestrians are also very important and they have rights too. So what regulations are you looking at considering? So we're considering capping the speed limit, the motorized speed limit at 15 miles an hour. And I say motorized because the e-bikes, you have to pedal to get the motor going and, and you could go over 15 miles an hour if you're pedaling enough, but, a, but the motorized cap would be at 15. Plus, you wouldn't be on the sidewalk with a motorized bicycle, would you? Well, in some places you can. We're talking about a corridor here in Uptown that, um, that would not allow them on the sidewalk. Mm-hmm. Uh, we recognize, the reason we allow bicycles on sidewalks is we recognize that we're not, 
we don't have complete streets with regards to our sidewalks. We're just not there yet, and it's going to be a while. So we have thousands of miles of road work, of roadway that needs sidewalks. Right. Uh, and so in some places you will be allowed, especially if uh, the sp- the speed limit's over 35 miles an hour. You can use the sidewalk or a bike. So ride. when you say limiting the scooters to 15 miles per hour, that's a software adjustment in the scooter yes. itself, yeah. not because you have there's no speedometer on the thing. So if you're if you're full throttling it, you don't know how fast you're going. Somebody said that some of the scooters have speedometers. I've ridden Bird. I haven't seen one. Okay. Uh, so the what you're also um, going to maybe require them to shut down operation at a certain time of day or yeah. night? Yes. Because why? Because there's no lights on them? If you're riding a scooter at 2 in the morning, you might probably be coming home from the bars. So um, <laughs> we want to make sure that people are safe. It's okay. dark out. And so the the discussion is that they would be well, disabled at 9 p.m. Have there been problems with riding these things in the dark after you're a little inebriated? Have there been problems with speed? Have people been hurt either riding the scooters or car accidents or pedestrian accidents? Yeah, with there, there have, have been. been. And I was out actually in San Diego over Christmas, and two people were killed in one night. That, on scooters? Mm-hmm, 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. Two separate incidents. They were both inebriated. Because I've noticed that these scooters now have, some of them have lights under them. Like they do. Like LED lights under right. them to light their, I right. guess, make them noticeable. Uh, you're also considering uh, getting them off the sidewalks, if I'm not mistaken. And it, when you get them off the sidewalks and reduce the speed, Councilman Larkin Eggleston says he's a little worried about that because that will increase the disparity between what the scooter can do and what a car can do. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Uh, well, the, they'll be banned in high pedestrian areas, and the only one that's been identified is like College, Tryon, Stonewall to 7th Street. That's the proposal right now, with staff having the right to ban other high pedestrian areas. But right now they can be on sidewalks. And you mentioned that the primary ridership are people who make $25,000 a year or less. Is that That's what? the largest population of users, yeah. But they're all across the spectrum. Right. Um, but that is a very high population is, of users. Is that why you are also considering uh, requiring scooter companies to place 20% of their inventory every morning at the mm-hmm. beginning of the day in uh, low-income neighborhoods? Yes. So these actually become a transportation alternative for people who do not have access to cars. That's right. Yeah, that's what we're finding is, is really popular. Does that, if, if you do that, I don't, uh, how many scooters are there in town? Um, 400? 400, eight? I believe. So if you put 20% of 400 in that, that's uh, 80 mm-hmm. scooters. How would, and you put them in low-income areas where they're using them to get, I guess, downtown or wherever they go to mm-hmm. work. Uh, what does that do to traffic flow? Is that going to cause more problems because you've concentrated? Well, of course, they're concentrated right now downtown. They're using them now, though, in those right. areas. We have heat maps to show where they're being used. And there's a high concentration just north of, of um, Uptown. Okay. Raleigh charges $300 per scooter to scooter companies. Yeah. We don't charge anything. Right. Why and how likely are we to begin charging these companies? And I know that in places where... Cities have begun charging for scooters. Some scooter companies have increased, have doubled the price, right, which right. I think is gouging to make up for the three hundred dollars, which is nothing. Yeah, three hundred rides. Well, but, I think th- what we're looking at is a dynamic pricing model. So we're we are looking at a fee that actually could be reduced if the scooter company gets people to wear a helmet, gets them to park it in the right place. So as an incentive. Um, g- charge a fee and then have an incentive to be able to lower the fee if they get people to use these things safely. $300 concerns me because the state um, only allows cities to charge $30 per automobile. So, and that's a tax. And so it's conceivable that the state could say that's a tax. And so I think well, we yeah, have Yeah, it to is have, a tax. Right. But we don't have the authority to charge that as a tax. So it's a fee. I think that if we charge something reasonable to offset the costs of running scooters on our public streets that the public pays for, then you know we probably have a better chance of keeping that. Do any of these vehicles, scooters or bicycles, have to be inspected on a regular basis for safety conditions? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think that they do. Okay. Now, I don't know that there's as much that can go wrong as with like an automobile, right. you know, you really have to get your emissions. There they go. Yeah. Emissions <laughs> tested. Yeah. Um, 
the, the scooters are descending on our window. They're yeah. Not, they're not happy with this conversation. You, uh, you're going to make this decision on Monday night. Is that right? Or are you going uh, to continue plan. talking or I actually I think we voting? need to continue talking about it. I would like to – there's there's – several options in this ordinance, and it might be we have to sort of vote piecemeal on these things. Well, Regina on Facebook writes, leave scooters alone, exclamation point, good grief, exclamation point. So you have her input. Let's see if a pedestrian's out there that wants to win. (laughs) And the other issue is that it'll be a dynamic um, number in terms of how many, we're not capping the scooters were saying that if a company shows more usage, they can add another 50. If they show that they're not being used, they have to reduce them. So that'll be dynamic, too. Let's talk about something else that's kind of surprising, and, and, and I, I don't even know how to react to this. But for six years, we have been building out this thing called the Cross Charlotte Trail. It's a series of walking and bike trails that was designed to run for 26 miles through the city and connect all these different areas of the city together. And now, after, after six years of construction, we have discovered we're a little short on cash to the tune of $77 million. Mm-hmm. How can that be that we're just now discovering we're short $77 million? That's exactly what council members are asking, that we first learned about that on Monday. Um, and we need more answers on how that came about and how that was calculated in the first place I and mean, how the, they got it I mean, the so original wrong. budget for this project is $38 million, right. and now we're $77 million short. That means they under-budgeted by two-thirds, right? Am I doing the math right? I, I don't know, because I don't know how the <laughs> math was done, and I'd like to know how the math was done and how you can talk, because that was done in 2012, and now we're in 2019. Right. And a lot of that is land acquisition, so I have questions like, how do you keep, how do you make an estimate like that in 2012 without everybody running up and buying up the land that's on e- that, you know, is on either side of that trail, knowing that the city's going to have to buy it? So, you know, there's a lot of questions. Is that there. what happened? Because Charlotte City staff I, I says know. the shortfall is because of costs that are significantly higher than when the project was originally estimated, which seems to me to be always the case. It's always, yeah. But, but, no matter what you build, if it's going to take years to build, it's going to get more expensive as the years right. go on, and you build that into your right. calculations, right. into right. your estimate. So are you saying that people, developers, property owners, knew that this thing was coming, so they they developed and raised the prices of it, so it was more expensive to buy the land you need for the. I don't. Land? I don't know that. I'm just saying it's the same with affordable housing, right? If we say we're going to run the light rail out that way, if we don't get proactive and buy the land, the land value goes up. This is why Walt Disney, when he built Disney World, uh, came in with a bunch of different c- companies that didn't have the name Disney in them and bought up all this land, so nobody knew what was going to happen. But government's different. That's why different. he did it that way. You know, government's different. We have to tell everybody what we're going to do right. and then ask for a bond to do it. And so you've got a much longer uh, time frame that you can actually say, now we're going to go ahead and do it. You know, we can't come in and secretly buy land with taxpayer money. So, but, but to your point, I mean, I, the construction costs also, we are being told that's the problem. I don't think we have all the answers yet. We want the answers. We made a commitment to build this trail, and I think we need to honor it. Well, you may not have the answers, but I have some more questions. Okay. So we'll come back and, and, and talk about that, and we'll talk about affordable housing, and we'll talk about the, the actually the federal government shutdown. I want to see what, what effect that's having on us, if any. It's Charlotte Talks with Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Julie Geiselt on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Chester Brook Academy, dedicated to preparing children academically, socially, and emotionally for kindergarten and beyond. Hosting an open house on Saturday, January 26th. Details at chesterbrookacademy.com. And Culture and Heritage Museums, presenting the Southern Sound Series New Year with the Travelin' McCorries, a bluegrass band, January 12th at the McKelvey Center. Details at chmuseums.org. South Carolina is just right. A conversation on why migrants from Central America are coming to the U.S. is in your future if you stick with us here because it's coming your way in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock with Joshua Johnson and his panel of experts on 1A. They will dive into the reasons why these folks are coming and what's going on in Central and South America. That's coming up and we will continue our conversation with Mayor Pro Tem Julie Eiselt in 32 seconds. It's your world. We help you explore it. For months now in Kenya, excavators have been destroying buildings across the country's capital city. It's your community. We help you understand it. 
Republican Mark Harris and his two attorneys met for nearly two hours Thursday morning in Raleigh with the state elections board's chief investigator, Joan Fleming. WFAE's Morning Edition is an essential way to start your day and stay connected to your world. Listen weekday mornings from 5 to 9 on 90.7 WFAE. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. Mayor Pro Tem Julie Iselt is here doing an bang-up job filling in for Mayor Vi Lyles, who joins us usually once a month on this program, but she was called away for official duties somewhere else. Um, let's talk a little bit more, not much more, but a little bit more about this Cross Charlotte Trail, because it was a, a, a revelation to council and to the rest of us that the project is $77 million short and was only budgeted at $38 million uh, several years ago, back in 2012. Uh, and we're nearing where we should be at the end of this project, and we can't finish it. WFAE and the Charlotte Observer are both reporting that this shortfall leaves the future of the project in doubt. If you agree with that, does that mean the future of the project as originally conceived or something that doesn't even come close to what we started to do is going to be in doubt? Or we're just, we'll, just gonna, we'll just stop where we are now, and that'll be the end of it. No, <laughs> no. We made a commitment to build this trail. And, and one thing that we have asked the manager is, where can that money come from? Can it come from CDOT? Can it come from uh, tourism revenue? You know, the High Line in New York is a tourism attraction. Right. And so we, we got to get creative and figure out how to get this done. We made a commitment to get it done, and that's what we have to do. Uh, City Manager Marcus Jones, who was not here... Right. When this was planned and budgeted for, says the estimates uh, that, that were there at the beginning had not accounted for how much more expensive it was going to be to build the trail in areas that are already developed. Is this a project of the planning department or is this something else? some other entity within the city that is responsible for this? Because I know we were, we were, that we were without a planning director for eons. I don't, Wondering I'm not how even much sure that that's the issue. The issue is how these things get calculated. Mm -hmm. You know, who's, who's doing these formulas and how do they come up with them? Right. To me, that's the issue. And that's what we have to figure out. Marcus came in when he came in as city manager and saw that we were piecemealing these projects. And so he's come up with a 10 year capital, a capital spend um, projection, which apparently we didn't have before for complete projects. Hmm. It, and that just, coming from the banking industry, it, it stuns me a little bit that we would have done anything piecemeal like that and talked about it in current dollars. So, okay. So how much has been built and what is left to do? This is supposed to be 26 miles long. So where are we today and how much more do we need for the $77 million we have to scrounge around for? So we can complete half of it. We've got three projects that are shovel ready that will connect segments that have been built but aren't connected. Mm -hmm. And those are ready to go. And that'll complete half of the trail. That'll complete 18 miles of the trail. And I think we should do that. So are we going to find the $77 million? Are we going to have a bond issue to, to raise $77 million to no. fix it? But you've said we're going, to, we're going to finish it. How? Well, they have to find the money to finish it. Well, that's so, what I'm asking. Where's it coming from? <laughs> and those are questions that we still have. I, I've okay. been on the phone with the manager as I have other council members. We don't even know if 77 is, you know, how did they get that number? So I want to know the methodology that they even came up with that number by and what, you know, have you really looked at other options? They're talking about giving, um, involving developers who do build. And we've, we've seen rezonings that come before us on the Greenway where they are being asked to, to give that property to the Greenway um, as a part of their rezoning. So those are options. Uh, but we need more information before we proclaim that this isn't going to get built or that I, I think the last thing we would want to do is say we're going to go back it out, out to the people and ask for more money. So we have an interesting um, and provocative Twitter comment that to conclude this line of questioning. Last month, they say, the mayor and council praised the transparency in the city budget. Given the surprise shortfall for funding of the Cross Charlotte Trail, are you worried about the solvency of other key projects? That is something the manager has been working on for two years, which is how this came about. I have not heard that there's other key projects that, I mean, this was a big project. This was a big one. But yes, I would say we have to go back and say, are we being as transparent as we thought we Why were? Why isn't this a park project, a county project? Because the county runs the parks, right? Right. We're looking at this as a mobility. So the county has greenways all over the city, uh -huh. but they weren't connected. So we identified two pretty key greenways, Irwin, um, 
uh, Irwin Greenway, Irwin, I don't have that name right, and Sugar Creek, but two major ones. Okay. And then we saw that if we connected that through this 26 mile, it's not a trail, it's a, it's a road, it's, it's a, um, Parkway that people can ride bikes on, right. that they can actually get into uptown on. Mm-hmm. We realize that this is another mobility option for people to get to work, to get around town. So we're including it as part of our mobility plan. Can you ride scooters on them? Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I ask you because, let's see here. We have two final questions on scooters from people who have been listening. to Kisa on Facebook, would the city be open to a private company, not police or cats, enforcing scooter safety? I feel an entrepreneur on the other end of this. Right. <laughs> um, I'd like to know the plan for enforcement. I've asked that Monday night. I asked that question. So I want to see what the enforcement plan is in the first place before okay. we go down that road. And Jonathan, on Twitter, the city council needs to consider the ever-increasing parking prices in Uptown before adding regulations to restrict scooters. Some lots are up 70%, per- 70% in six months. Not sustainable, yeah. he says. So they won't be prohibited from being in uptown. They, they'll be prohibited from being on the sidewalks. But those sidewalks, ha- uh, those roads have um, bike lanes. Um, they, it, it's a very small area where they can't be on the sidewalk. They have to be in the road. And typically, like North Tryon, you rarely get somebody going that fast in North Tryon. They're going to have to ride in the road. Let's switch gears here. A former New York City mayor, possible presidential candidate, Michael Bloomberg, was in town just be around the holidays uh, to mm-hmm. disclose that Bloomberg Philanthropies had selected Charlotte as one of 20 cities participating in a campaign to accelerate environmental initiatives. We're the 19th of the 20 cities to be chosen. It's a two-year, $70 million program. There, now, well, there's your $70 million right there. Uh, uh, Bloomberg might agree that this is an environmentally friendly project. Uh, well, we applied to be part of this. We got it. Why, we were, why were we chosen, and what will we do with that $70 million? So uh, we were chosen because we had a really good plan. Um, he, he came to Charlotte to announce that. He didn't go to all 20 cities, to my knowledge. So he really liked what we were proposing. He'll be, his organization will be providing technical assistance um, on, on implementation of policies to further, basically, the Paris Initiative. Uh, so that, that is essentially what he's going to be doing. Our staff worked really hard on this. Um, so how will we spend it? Where's the money going to go? Do we know yet? Mostly on technical assistance. Okay. Um, they're going to facilitate the development of passage of high-impact policies. They're going to be collecting data, helping us collect data so that we can use that for the design um, of, of different plans, of different programs that are really focused on lowering emissions and, again, really going after the goals of the Paris Agreement. Okay. Uh, the federal government remains in shutdown. Uh, tomorrow will be the f- uh, paycheck day and yeah. paychecks will not be issued. Uh, we're in the third week, I think, uh, of this. And, and it's, it is having a trickle-down effect in a lot of cities across the country because it isn't just the 800,000-plus federal employees right. who are out. When they're not there, they're not eating lunch in the nearby restaurants. They're not using transit. Uh, uh, they're not using the dry cleaners next to their business, uh, et cetera. So it's causing problems. And obviously, if you don't get paid, yeah. you can't pay your bills. So are we feeling it? Are we likely to feel it here in Charlotte? So tomorrow, the uh, TSA doesn't get paid. Yeah. That I talked to our airport director yesterday, and um, he said, you know, a lot of those folks get paid $15 an hour. So that, that's hurt. that hurts. Yeah. They are not allowed to supplement their pay. Uh, the airport is not. And so they've done things like they've had their employees bring in food, and donations of food for TSA employees, anything that can help offset some of their bills, like their grocery bill. Uh, it's going to be painful when those folks don't get paid tomorrow. And I think that's when we're, we're probably going to start seeing and hearing more about this. Some cities have asked landlords not to penalize people if they can't pay their rent, not to evict them. Yeah. But a lot of these folks are on hourly, on hourly wages. And some of these people will not get back pay. When the, when the government resumes operations, I'm told that some of these folks will not get back pay, even though they're working. Mm-hmm. Uh, as this goes on, some cities, I think Washington among them, is doing the government's job for them. They are picking up the trash yeah. at, at federal installations, although I don't know why there would be trash in a closed building. But they're, they're picking up the trash, and they're keeping a, a running tally 
Mm -hmm. uh, and they plan to bill the federal government when they get back in business uh, for the running tally of doing their work for them. Does Mecklenburg County, does Charlotte, does North Carolina, are, are we involved in any of that? Do you see a need to be involved in any of that? Well, I think isn't the mall in Washington, isn't that a national park? Yeah. So I think that's where a lot of the trash is. So mostly it's happening in the national parks. Okay. So I don't know that we, we're not impacted by that here in Charlotte. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, well, I guess we'll have to keep an eye on this because it does affect TIA, uh, uh, what am I trying TSA. to say? TSA. TSA, and, and, and it also affects the affects food stamp, the food stamp program. Yes, although they said that they're not going to hold those food stamps back. Okay. But we have the Federal Reserve here. Right. Um, so we have employees here that it's going to impact, especially when they don't get paid. So we mentioned the loss of the CIAA tournament, uh, uh, and Pamela on Facebook says, I think we lost the tournament because of the gentrification that is going on in Charlotte. I don't know whether that's true, but Michael emails, Baltimore is a great city for hosting sporting events. In the years I've attended the Army-Navy game, I never saw any type of surcharge and hotel rooms within walking distance that were more reasonably priced than those here. But we lost the tournament. We kind of knew it was coming. We also were unable to lure Amazon to town among some of the disappointments of 2018. But in December, it was announced that Avid Exchange's Charlotte headquarters will include the addition of over 1,200 new jobs. Fortune 500 technology company Cognizant is expanding their Charlotte operations by 300 jobs. And, of course, Honeywell is relocating its headquarters here. All three of these wins, of course, include incentives from Charlotte and from the state. Avid Exchange will get, I think, $3.3 million from the city and the county, plus $1.7 million in community college training. Cognizant is getting $2 million from the state, more from the county. Honeywell will get $17.1 million over 15 years. But at least... Funding trees adding over 400 jobs. Okay, and at least with that Honeywell vote, uh, the incentive vote, one council member, Republican Ed Driggs, voted no. He's one of two Republicans yeah. on council, and they are the party of business, and he voted no for incentives for a business. Why? He, for Ed, it's more about process. He felt like we needed to be given more information, and, and I understand that. He, he's not against giving incentives to Honeywell. It's the way it was, it was presented. He wants more detail and more information. But when these incentives, from the city's standpoint and the county, they've got to be here, and they've got to hire those people, and they have to pay those taxes, then they get some of that back. It isn't money out the door from taxpayers. So it's, it's tax money that comes here because they're here and then goes to them. But we do need to know more about how that's calculated. Um, and that, I think that's really what Ed is asking, is for that information sooner. It's, it's a little difficult because the sooner you give it to people, the sooner it leaks out. Right. Um, but to be clear, because a lot of people don't like incentives and they don't think that they're fair, and they say, well, you want to give an incentive to a major, 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 major company, why can't I get one for my house? Yeah. Uh, but what you're saying is because there's, a, there's a quid pro quo here. Right. They're coming here, they're bringing jobs. These jobs are pretty well paying in the case of Honeywell. Right. Uh, and, and they have to be here for the time that they said they right. were going to be here, right? and they have to pay their taxes, and then if they pay their taxes and live up to their end of the agreement, the city lives up to their side. Correct. And it's after always, the fact. It's, it's, they're going to pay more than what they're getting back. So there's a net increase. If you're just getting a rebate on your house, right. you, there's not a net benefit to the city. Because I know uh, Tariq Wakari said that uh, one of these deals that we talked about here, and I've forgotten which one, was a deal he would do any day of the week because we're going to make out like bandits. Oh, well, <laughs> wouldn't have been the words I would have chosen. Uh, homicides. Let's talk about that because you've talked about this in the past. Homicides in Charlotte were down mm -hmm. slightly last year over the previous several years. But so far this year, we have had more than our fair share of yeah. homicides. So we ended the year with a little hope, which seems to have quickly abated. What's your take you know, it, it's a hard issue because in Charlotte, it seems to be so random. It's not like you go to Chicago and they're mostly happening on the south side or, you know, in certain neighborhoods. When we looked at the 2018 data, it's, it's all over the city. Um, the police department's working very hard on it. Any homicide, you know, I, I don't like to look at it as data so much because any singular hom homicide is is terrible. It's affecting someone's life. It's ripping apart a family. Uh, any homicide it is, is bad, and that's what we have to focus on. So, you know, the ones this year, it 
came out of the box, came out of the gates with homicides, it's really disturbing and it's upsetting. It doesn't necessarily indicate a trend. Okay. I, I want to go back to the government shutdown. Mm -hmm. You're a Democrat. Uh-huh. Oh, man. <laughs> now we're going to talk about city stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, you're a Democrat. Where do yeah. you come down on this uh, in terms of what, what, what should happen? I mean, we had this meeting at the White House that lasted 32 seconds yesterday where the president walked out of the room because Nancy Pelosi said she's not going to give him his wall, period. We've got nothing to discuss. Both sides say the other side is being obstructive uh, and won't move and won't negotiate. Uh, what's your take on it? I think there's a lot of petulant children in Washington that have to get together and figure this out for the sake of the people, like TSA workers who are hurting. I'll let you off the hook with that. Uh, <laughs> Charlotte has hired a new city attorney to replace longtime Bob Hageman, uh, our city attorney Bob Hageman, who retired. Uh, we hired city attorney from Durham, Patrick Baker. They say really nice things about him in Durham as he's walking out the door. He's a North Carolina native who has lived all of his life here, yeah. worked most of his life in that part of the state. But he decided at the age of 51 he had one more career move left in him. So why did Charlotte choose Patrick Baker over I would imagine there were other candidates. And when does he start? And you have 30 seconds. He oh. starts, I think, in, in March, in okay. two months. Uh, he's fantastic. Durham has had a lot of experiences that Charlotte has. So um, not only is it a city that experiences um, situations that we have, he's got all that experience that, that Bob had. He, he's been, he's almost as old as Bob. He's had as much experience. And he's going to be a great addition to Charlotte. We're excited for him to come. All right. Char uh, Charlotte Mayor Pro Tem, Julie Iselt, filled in today for Vi Lyles. Tell her to watch over her shoulders. <laughs> Thanks for the hour.